That's it. Now you can break that down into session swing trading where you're swinging the entire New York session or the London session and getting out before five o'clock in the morning, Eastern time. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's your model, if that's what you want to do and you don't want to do anything else because time of day and schedule school business, you know, your family life, you just don't want to be in front of charts a lot of times. You can make a career just by doing session only. Two o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the morning. There's your three hours. That's it. You're done. Or work the 8.30 to 11 o'clock morning session in equities and be done. Don't trade the afternoon or trade 1.30 to 4 as your PM session. That's, if that's what you want to be doing and that's the time that fits your, your window of opportunity, then there it is. The question is going to be, what can I do, ICT, if I can't do any of them? I don't know personally. Like, I, I don't know how to answer that because I don't fuck with Asia. It, it's very far and few between opportunities that form in Asia that I like. It's just, I just don't like it. Doesn't mean you can't find an opportunity there. I just don't have, I don't have the confidence as a mentor to say you should do that. Okay. You want to be in the highest order flow volume that's coming into the marketplace, which is London and New York session. And in the afternoon session too in New York. So those three time periods are kind of like your three, you know, the three best times of when you want to be trading and why you should be doing it. So if you're using the time of day idea coupled with that cell model in the spring months, going down in the summer months in stock indices, the ranges will be gravitating going lower. Now, not every single candle in the daily chart is going to be a down close. And that's another thing that neophytes do. They come in here and they think every candle is going to be a down close. But I thought it was, you know, the bearish bias was going to, you have to have other things, folks. And market profiles. Now, before I get any further with this one, <laughs> I am not talking about market profile. You know, where they do the little volume histogram, you know, on its side axis and they look for you know, point of control and all that stuff. That to me, no offense, Corpse, but that's bullshit stuff to me. Like, I, I don't think there's any reason for anybody to do that stuff. But if you're making money with it, God bless you. I'm not here to detract or, or say anybody that's making money with it can't make money with it going forward. I'm just saying I don't personally subscribe to that. And I already know what your volume profile shit's going to say to you before you see it. So market profiles. I have weekly profiles that I use and I use daily profiles. So what was that? I'm looking at the tendency for the market to do certain types of delivery. Uh, it'll make the high of the day in London and then go in consolidation the rest of the day in, in, in the New York session, or there'll be a classic sell day where it'll run up, create the high of the day in London and then sell off all day long and go close somewhere close to the low of the day or a classic buy day where it creates the low of the day in London and then rallies all throughout the day and then closes near the high of, the, of that, particular, you know, that particular day. There's seek and destroy where it's a day that looks like a really good trading opportunity and all of a sudden it hands you your ass. It starts chopping back and forth. As soon as you, as soon as you even think it's a seek and destroy day, you stop trading, turn the charts off, walk away. I have blown accounts in bonds. I have blown accounts in s p and i've blown accounts in forex getting caught in seek and destroy days pushing it thinking i'm i'm going to be able to come out of what i was doing and making it worse so one of the best things you can do is in all of your studying really put focus on days where you see it going higher high lower low higher high lower low higher high lower low and then all of a sudden later in the day it takes off and just blows out one other range and that's seek and destroy. Like nobody's allowed to be making money in that day. Then that, that's just, that's hard. It, it's demoralizing when you fall victim to it. And I've done it. I've done it. And unfortunately, there are times where I don't know when it's going to creep in. But here's how you know when it's likely to. It's going to be right before a big like FOMC day. It's going to be before a rate announcement type thing. Um, some kind of high impact news driver where the market participants are going to get cleaned out. 
And why would that happen? Think about why that would take place. Why would you expect it to happen? Because traders are going to do what? They're going to take a position before the report or whenever that big volatility news driver is going to you know, hit the marketplace and create these big CPI runs or like we saw in non-farm payroll yesterday, where it was one sidedness and it was a big 60 handle move drop right just like that in one minute. There are people out there that want to participate in that and they subscribe to their opinion and they want to get in the day before. Well, I admire, I admire their, you know, their courage. <laughs> it's rewarded with pain because this is exactly why that seek and destroy profile will manifest itself because that report is anticipating or in the minds of traders with that report, they're all anticipating a big move and everybody has an opinion. A lot of people are going to have a bullish opinion. A lot of people are going to have a bearish opinion. So for good measure, the algorithm does what? It does takes the initial short-term little intraday high out, brings people in on breakouts going long, and then it goes down and takes out a short-term low, knocking out their stop loss that went long and tripping in new traders going short with a breakout strategy. Then it goes back up to that short-term high it just formed and cleans that out. So now those that went short from up there and were lucky, now they're out of the marketplace. And it keeps doing that same thing all day long. Every high is taken out, every low is taken out. That's seek and destroy. Nobody gets to participate in that move. And as soon as you recognize that happen or that happening in the, in the marketplace, maybe you forgot about the economic calendar. Maybe you didn't pay attention to what's likely to occur tomorrow. That is when seek and destroy is likely to occur. Or it can happen intraday before the FOMC. This is why I tell my students, don't trade FOMC. Because you're likely to get caught up into a seek and destroy day before the two o'clock rate announcement comes out and then pfft, there it goes one direction and you wait for it because FOMC is always a two stage event. There's the initial move that's usually fake and the real move is the opposite direction. So these are conversations that are just too fucking good for a book. <laughs> okay, they're just too good for a book. And I know these people that like to take my shit and rebrand it and all that. They're going to take this stuff and they're going to include it in a little Amazon real quick books and shit. And they're not going to credit me, but you've heard me here talk about it. And it's in my mentorship stuff too. But market profiles are little templates that I have in my own personal study identified what the general characteristics look like and how that weekly profile should look. When is the weekly low likely to form? When is the weekly high likely to form? What is the overall characteristic of that weekly range going to look like if we were looking at it over, like, say, a 15-minute chart or an hourly chart? What would that perspective look like if we turned it into a line chart? And I spent a lot of time as a younger man trying to come up with ways like that. And what inspired me was uh, Larry Williams had a idea that was a uh, trading day of the month. Okay, and what he had was this little every month he had the S&P broken down and and the bond market broken down. And man, I'm telling you what, like there were times where it was like spot on. It was like a seasonal tendency for those individual two um, two markets that were showing you like critical key turning days. And if it was like you know, the fifth trading day of the month, it would create a high and then it would sell off for this many days. Man, I shit you not. This this shit was like I repped that shit like crazy. And my older folks that uh, that were with me when I was on America Online, um, Gate Trader, who is the guy that won in 2000 the stock division on Robin's Cup, the 24% return, <clears throat> which was respectful back then. Uh, Gate Trader was a, a, one of my original students when I was on America Online. And there's another guy, Chansom, okay, um, guy up in Alaska. He actually just um, – he made, I think he made his way into my last mentorship group. Uh, him and his son are going through it together. But uh, they know that I was repping that shit back then. And I was fascinated with it. And I thought that it was like next level shit. So I said, okay, well, if, I don't know how he did that shit. He said he crunched numbers and ran all the, you know, what the market did for this many years. And, and he came out with that output. And I did see it fail sometimes. I mean, it, when, it, when it failed, it was, you know, like anything else. But when it was on, it was so good. It was very similar to what I just outlined here for the yearly range, okay? So I gave you the entire map for every single year. Why do you teach that you ought to be under your wing for a year, Michael? Michael, tell me why I got to subscribe to your bullshit for a full year to learn how to trade. I just told you in this video up to, or this 
discussion right now. Because if you don't see it and you're not walked through it with a hand holding, which is what I did in my private mentorship, you can't see it. You won't you won't appreciate how it is consistent. And this is the reason why when I gave my analysis in private mentorship, it's 90 percent accurate. It's logged and ain't a fucking person can say anything about it because it's all been witnessed. It's all there. It's recorded. It's live. It's there all before it happened. And I used the things I'm talking about right here. So I went from using his idea that he was building these little like seasonal tendencies for each individual month to, okay, I want to know what does the weekly range look like on average. And I knew I wouldn't get one that matches everything because everything's going to look different. But I want to reduce it down to what type of weekly range would it look like and what tends to repeat a lot. And those templates is what I share in my core content. Now, <clears throat> the problem is students that see those things, they want me to be able to say, this is what that template's going to be this week when I need Monday's trading. And then I want to see what Tuesday's doing. So it's a matter of knowing what's occurring right then and there. Like I got to be in it. Like I got to, I got to be in there trading it. Now there are other times where if you're in those seasonal times, like in the spring to summer months where it's likely to go lower, I'm many times able to say, okay, because of the economic calendar, the way the economic calendar is, and there's a lot of impact news on Wednesday or Thursday. Well, what does that mean? Look at your templates in that core content. Which one has a higher low forming on that Wednesday or Thursday template? And that's the weekly template you're going to be following probably for that week. That's it. I just gave it to you. And if it doesn't pan out, you just eat it. It's a loss like anything else. It's a cost of doing business. But you're going to find that it's almost like fucking fortune telling. It's it's weird. It's weird how it just pans out. But <clears throat> it takes a lot of courage to, to, to see that and experience. You're not going to be able to just look at it and say, oh, I figured this out. It's going to be so easy. you got to do this. It's, it's, this is a lifestyle. And you'll learn. And then I went to studying how I can do this on an intraday basis. So I had intraday templates or market profiles or little tendencies for the market to do certain little patterns and, and delivery of price. I put it in that type of format too. And you see that in the day trading portion of the core content. So I'm looking at days with the expectation it's going to deliver a certain way. Now, I'm not saying I'm 100% right. I'm not even claiming to be 90% right in that regard. But I know if I fall victim to a intraday profile that I'm trying to trade, if it fails, I know which one it's going to go to if I fail there. And it's a matter of experience and knowing how to navigate that. But narrative is knowing how it's going to use one of those templates. And that's what makes this complicated. And it's easy for people to say, fuck this, it's too hard. He makes it complicated. No. If you want laser guided precision, it's going to take some fucking effort and it's going to put, put some wrinkles on you. Okay, it's going to gray some of your hair. That's just what I require because that's the way I'm wired. I want something that's next fucking level outside the reach of the common person or trader. That's why when you see me executing, that shit is next to flawless. And you can't get those results with this retail horse shit renamed. It doesn't exist anywhere else. It does not exist. And these fucking jokers that say, oh, it's supply and demand. It's not supply and demand. These, these things I'm teaching you are highly specific. They're very specific. It's not an open range that you fucking figure out where you're going to be buying or selling at. Here's your zone. Which where, where are you buying in that zone? Sam don't even teach you that. <laughs> Sidon. So that logic, while in its infancy, is better than support and resistance, but it's still lacking. And you have to be precise about why are you buying here? And if you don't know where you're buying and why you're buying it, how the fuck can you put your stop loss in an effective place and know that it ain't going to get hit? Look at the trade examples I show you. You see, oh, he's got a $3,000 stop loss there. Whew, that's a lot. Look at the profit target. It's always more than three. Always more than three times. Sometimes more than that. Sometimes five. Sometimes ten. Don't get caught up with the numbers. Look at the logic I'm showing you. Why I'm putting my stop loss where I'm putting it. It's exactly how I teach it. 
The algorithm is going to respect that. You, you see, oh man, he's putting his thought thoughts right there. I couldn't do that because you haven't been doing this long enough and you haven't adopted what? The experience of seeing it. I've handled this stuff for 30 years. I've, I've been in it for three decades. I've seen this shit pan out so many times. I know how to trust it. And if I lose, if I lose at it, it's not a big deal. I know that it will repeat again. And if I took a loss, I can get that back easily. It's easy. Losing is hard for a neophyte. It's it's impossible to get through a losing set of trades as a new student. You need encouragement. You need to be able to be around other people to, to say, hey, look, I've been there too. And that's one of the benefits of being in a community like this. Because I don't want you all to simply saying, here's where I made money. High five, ICT. That's cool. A lot of people like to see that. I like seeing it. It, it, it fluffs my ego. I ain't going to lie to you. It feels good to see my students doing well. But I also really want to see folks share where they're fucking up, what they're doing wrong. Because not only will it be an opportunity for you to get me replying to you saying you did this incorrectly and you should have been focusing on that. You'll learn from it and other people will learn from that. But you're all afraid to show what would I open this whole presentation up with. You don't, you don't want to show your weaknesses. You don't show where you've done it wrong. And that's where the learning occurs. You don't learn anything when you did it right. That's sugar-coated. That's candy-coated bullshit. You're not going to constantly win. You're going to lose. You're going to lose money. You're going to do it wrong. And how are you going to take that? Are you going to lose your shit and lose your mind about it? And, oh, man, I got to go back in right away and do it. Why? I'll talk about that in a moment. You need to know your model. And your market. And stop trying to chase whatever the fuck I'm doing. If I'm trying to do something in the marketplace and you have a model already arrived at and, and a particular market that you want to trade in, you can see nobody's been able to convince me to trade in crypto. I'm never going to touch it. <laughs> I'm never going to touch that shit. But you all watch me have an exodus from Forex. And I've given you all the reasons why I have no interest in them going back in because I know Shit's coming, and I don't want to be wrecked in that. I don't want to be caught up in some deep pegging bullshit. I don't want to be in that at all. And you you can take that risk on if you want to. I'm not talking you out of it. I'm not telling you to stay in it. It's a matter of personal choice. My trust is in stock indices. I went there first. When I started finding consistency, I found it there. That's where I found it, okay, as a commodity trader in 1993. Any consistency, any any consistency, started its formation in that year in stock indices and bonds. That was it, and I was trying to find mega trades and corn and wheat and live cattle and pork bellies and crude oil and gold, all those uh, copper, cotton, coffee, sugar. And I never touched orange juice again. <laughs> once, it, once it spanked my ass, it took 50% of the option premium in one night. Uh, was it? I was like, yeah, fuck orange juice. You know, I, I, there for a while, I didn't want to drink it. I was so mad about it. But I don't drink it today because it's too acidic. But And they put shit in it now that I don't want to be drinking. But uh, it's another discussion for another day. But you need to know your model and your market. And you want to be back testing. Okay. At least a minimum of three months. With tape reading interwoven in that, you know, I optimally you want to do it at least for six months. So you can split it up with the first three months of back testing, no tape reading, all hindsight, going back and looking at old data, logging it, seeing where the patterns form, what it looked like, how much risk would have been incurred, how many times it would have failed, how many times it would have panned out, where your potential entries would be pyramided if you want to do pyramid. Some of you not, might not want a pyramid. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't let me because I do it inspire you to feel like you have to do that you might be just one entry and go to per, you know first partial or second partial and or go to full target but don't go to full target when you're first learning you're going to frustrate yourself because you're going to be doing it wrong you'll be entering too soon entering too late or entering incorrectly